My patience finally snapped. If you don't like the way I handle things, you're welcome to leave, I spat, surprised by the venom in my voice. A moment of startled silence followed. I flinched, expecting a tidal wave of guilt, but to my surprise, a sense of calm washed over me. No regrets. My name is Susan, 33, married to John with a rambunctious three-year-old named Lily. Our life wasn't glamorous, just a symphony of laundry, dishes, and the occasional tantrum. But it was mine. And after years of monotony, I'd come to appreciate its quiet rhythm. The past six months, however, had been like a discordant note in the melody. It all started with a seemingly innocent remark. This outfit needed more care, Susan, Patricia, my sister-in-law huffed, holding up a slightly wrinkled blouse. Her voice dripped with a kind of disdain that never failed to grate on me. Oh, sorry, I mumbled, taking the garment. It must have gotten mixed in with the rest. Of course it did, she sniffed, a hint of superiority lacing her words. But someone with an eye for Don Brands like me would have noticed. With that, she sashayed off, leaving me feeling like a clumsy oaf. This was par for the course with Patricia. A single, 40-year-old woman who seemed to believe I was her personal assistant. The laundry incident was just the tip of the iceberg. Today, it was lunch. Making Lily's lunch again? Could you whip me up something, too? She chirped, waltzing into the kitchen. Maybe you could make your own, I suggested gently, already knowing the answer. Oh, honey, she cooed, fluttering her eyelashes in a way that made me want to scream. Never made lunch in my life. My mommy always did it for me. I'm not your mother, I gritted out, frustration building. Ignoring me completely, she continued. And by the way, I borrowed Lily's lunchbox for work. Hope you don't mind. Borrowed, I shrieked. You took it without asking. Lily was crying this morning because her favorite bear lunchbox was missing. Patricia's facade faltered for a second, but she recovered quickly. Oops, didn't realize, she said, her voice dripping with fake remorse. Thought you made it for me since it was on the table. Then, the kicker. It was perfect for my diet, by the way, she chirped, her usual smugness returning. Not a bite left. No, thank you. No acknowledgement of my frantic morning spent searching for the missing lunchbox. My blood pressure simmered. Passive-aggressive revenge wasn't my style, but I couldn't take it anymore. For the next few days, her lunches mysteriously consisted solely of frozen meals. It didn't seem to faze her. The real issue, I realized, was deeper than a wrinkled shirt or a stolen lunchbox. It was the constant feeling of being taken advantage of, of living under someone else's rules in my own home. Six months ago, John and I had moved in with his parents and Patricia. My mother-in-law, a kind and gentle woman, had suffered a stroke a year prior. Although she could still manage with a cane, her health made it impossible for her to keep up with her full-time job. The arrangement seemed perfect. We helped with the house, they helped with Lily. But Patricia, used to a life of luxury, saw it as an opportunity to shirk responsibility. Susan, you're a lifesaver, my mother-in-law wheezed gratefully after yet another of Patricia's antics. This was another frustration. Every time Patricia and I clashed, my mother-in-law would invariably apologize on her behalf. Enough was enough. I loved my family, but living under this constant tension was taking its toll. Maybe, I thought, a change was needed. Maybe it was time to rewrite the melody of our lives. My world turned upside down after my mother-in-law's collapse. While she wasn't bedridden or in constant need of care, the situation called for some support. My initial plan was to offer occasional help, but John, my ever-optimistic husband, had other ideas. Let's move in with your parents, he declared one evening after work. My jaw dropped. Move in? Just like that? I sputtered. Wouldn't that disrupt your mom? What about our lease? John, ever the charmer, brushed away my concerns. It'll be fine, he insisted. It's my childhood home after all. Besides, Mom would love having her son and granddaughter around. His easygoing nature sometimes bordered on naivete. Sure, it might be a breeze for him, but what about me? And what about Patricia, my headstrong sister-in-law who already resided there? But Patricia has a job, I stammered picturing her shirking all the responsibility onto me. Won't it be too much for her to handle alone? John shrugged with the vagueness that sometimes drove me crazy. Help out? 
Yeah, sure, he mumbled, seemingly oblivious to my growing anxiety. Before I could fully voice my concerns, the wheels were already in motion. The next thing I knew, we were lugging boxes into John's childhood home. As predicted, my mother-in-law wore a mask of conflicted emotions on moving day. Susan, you really didn't have to do this, she said, her voice laced with something that resembled guilt. It became abundantly clear John hadn't exactly been transparent about his plans. Thankfully, time, as it often does, had a way of smoothing things over. Our initial awkwardness melted away as we settled into a new routine. My mother-in-law, a gentle soul, was a welcome addition to our family. She actively participated in housework, calling it a form of therapy after her health scare. It reminds me of my cooking days with your mother, she'd say, a touch of nostalgia in her voice. Lily, our rambunctious daughter, thrived in the new environment. Kindergarten had expanded her vocabulary, fueled her appetite, and instilled a newfound assertiveness. Gone were the days of meek acceptance when her favorite outfit landed in the laundry pile. But Grandma says I look super cute today, just like a princess, she'd declare with a defiant puff of her chest, a mischievous glint in her eyes. These little battles, these everyday moments, were the tapestry of our new life. Life wasn't perfect, but it was ours, and with each passing day, the melody felt a little sweeter, a little more harmonious. My initial optimism about living with my in-laws started to crack when John made a startling request. Since we're living with your mom now, he declared one morning, maybe you could increase my allowance? I blinked, stunned. Allowance? What allowance? Well, he elaborated, licking his lips. We're not paying rent or utilities anymore, right? So that money could be my allowance. My jaw clenched. Free? I thought, incredulous. Is he serious? Living in my mother-in-law's house, which had been paid off years ago by her late husband, did mean a decrease in expenses. But it wasn't free living. We still bought groceries, daily necessities, and contributed to a home maintenance fund for unforeseen repairs. Additionally, with two extra people, food costs had gone up. Plus, we were diligently saving for our daughter, Lily's future. John, on the other hand, rarely ate out and had limited social interaction, content to spend his days off playing video games. Why did he need an allowance? Despite my confusion, I agreed to a small amount. It wouldn't kill me, but his attitude rankled. Then came the utilities issue. A few days later, John, seemingly disgruntled, muttered, Why are we paying anything at all? This is Mom's house. He marched into her room, leaving me flabbergasted. Peeking in, I witnessed a scene that chilled me. John, red-faced, was demanding an explanation about the living expenses we contributed. My mother-in-law, usually so kind, sat there, her gaze distant, a resigned emptiness in her eyes. It looked as though she'd given up long ago. John, catching sight of me, shot me a smug grin. We don't have to pay anymore, he announced, leaving the room with a victorious swagger. I felt a surge of anger and self-loathing for marrying such a self-absorbed man, but my anger simmered with a cold dread. If I refused to contribute, wouldn't I be painted as the villain? The unappreciative daughter-in-law who refused to help? Suddenly, a soft chuckle broke the tension. My mother-in-law, her eyes regaining a spark, looked at me and said, Ah, uh, Susan, shall we have some tea? Her voice, laced with a quiet strength, offered an unexpected comfort. Maybe, I thought, there was another way out of this mess. Maybe, together, my mother-in-law and I could navigate this absurd situation. For the first time, I felt a glimmer of hope amidst the chaos. Dinner time with my mother-in-law and Lily was a haven in the chaos. We'd gather around the kitchen table, hands dusted with flour, giggling as Lily molded dumplings into fantastical shapes. This time, as my mother-in-law expertly answered a call from John, her phone on speakerphone, I felt a knot of dread tighten in my stomach. Hey, come on, answer the phone properly. What a rude guy, I muttered, glancing at her impassive face. Just forgot the shopping list, she chuckled, as John whined about needing help with groceries for the upcoming holiday. Tell him to help out once in a while, I shot back, frustration simmering. Suddenly, Patricia's voice cut through the line. John, did Mom answer? Do you think Lily messed with it? 
A flicker of unease crossed my mother-in-law's face, mirroring my own. We exchanged a silent glance, then, with a rush of adrenaline, I slammed my sticky hand on the record button. The conversation that transpired was a chilling revelation. Patricia and John, completely unaware of their audience, discussed my mother-in-law's hidden stash, her late husband's inheritance. Their callous words, punctuated by John's agreement to Patricia's morbid wish to speed things up, sent shivers down my spine. The knot in my stomach turned to ice. They were a threat to her safety. With trembling hands, I washed away the flower and dialed the police. Their response, however, was disheartening. It was a family matter, they said. But family wasn't supposed to be like this. Back in the kitchen, my mother-in-law, a steely resolve replacing her usual gentle demeanor, addressed Patricia and John, who had just walked in. Sit down, she said, her voice firm. We had something to discuss. As John and Patricia exchanged nervous glances, I pressed play on the recording. The silence that followed was deafening. The smugness on their faces had evaporated, replaced by a mixture of fear and denial. My mother-in-law, her voice surprisingly strong, spoke next. I understand how you feel, she began, but I won't be a victim. I've been planning this for a while now. A collective gasp escaped their lips. I'm selling this house and moving, she continued, a quiet determination shining in her eyes. This house is no longer a haven for me. For weeks, this conversation had been brewing between us. My mother-in-law, weary of Patricia's manipulations and John's apathy, had confided in me. We knew the biggest hurdle was Patricia, who considered the house her personal piggy bank. Now, with the truth exposed, my mother-in-law was taking control. The house, once a symbol of shared memories, had become a cage. But as she spoke, a flicker of hope ignited within me. Maybe, just maybe, this was just the beginning of a new chapter for all of us. Living with my in-laws wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. My biggest thorn was Patricia, my sister-in-law. Despite having a job, she contributed nothing to the household. It's my hard-earned money, she'd declare, justifying her exorbitant spending on beauty treatments and vacations. I can spend it how I please. My father-in-law, bless his soul, used to keep her in check. But since his passing, Patricia had run amok. Chores? Not a chance. Financial responsibility? Laughable. My mother-in-law, a kind and gentle woman, had borne the brunt of Patricia's entitlement for years. But something shifted when I brought up the topic of contributions. It's weird, Patricia scoffed. Dad said I should save up instead of paying living expenses. Well, how many years has it been since you started working? My mother-in-law countered, her voice surprisingly firm. You must be quite the wealthy lady by now. Patricia, for the first time, seemed speechless. Her usual bluster vanished, replaced by a panicked look. This tension must have woken up Lily, who wandered in, rubbing her eyes. If you do something wrong, she declared in her innocent voice, you should say sorry, right? Can Papa and Ma aren't you doing that? This unexpected question hung in the air, a silent accusation. Patricia, flustered, snapped, What's so funny? You must have said something to Mom. Before I could respond, my mother-in-law stepped in, her voice sharp. Stop it! Taking a deep breath, I addressed Patricia directly. I find it funny, I said calmly, because Lily seems more mature than you. She understands the concept of taking responsibility. Patricia's face contorted with anger, but I held her gaze. This charade had gone on long enough. Later that evening, while John and I were putting Lily to bed, my mother-in-law approached us, a determined glint in her eyes. I've decided to sell the house, she announced. It's time for me to start a new chapter. John and I exchanged surprised glances. We knew Patricia wouldn't take this well, but the truth was, the house wasn't a haven anymore. It was a battleground. My mother-in-law's decision, born out of years of frustration, felt like a liberation. Perhaps for all of us, it was the push we needed to finally rewrite our own stories. The tension had reached a boiling point. After weeks of simmering resentment towards Patricia's entitled behavior, my frustration finally exploded. I do everything, I fumed, pointing an accusing finger. Laundry, lunches, and not a word of appreciation from you. Even Lily can say thank you. Why can't you? Patricia's face flushed crimson. 
If you don't like it, leave, she spat back. This is our house. Ours? I scoffed. Where's your contribution? Or do you expect me to wash your tacky underwear forever? It was a low blow, but the indignation coursing through me wouldn't be contained. Maybe it's time you found your own place. And some shame. Patricia sputtered, her usual bravado replaced by a petulant scowl. But before she could retort, my mother-in-law intervened, her voice surprisingly firm. Enough! Taking a deep breath, I addressed the room. Perhaps the problem isn't the house, I said, my voice surprisingly steady. Maybe it's who's in it. The irony wasn't lost on anyone. A recent TV segment on adult children living rent-free with their parents flashed in my mind, and a silent accusation hung in the air. Perhaps it resonated with John and Patricia, too, because for the first time, they seemed subdued. A few days later, the inevitable hammer blow fell. My mother-in-law, her eyes filled with a quiet resolve, announced, I'm selling the house. You have until the end of the month to find somewhere else. She offered no apologies, no justifications. It was clear staying under the same roof was no longer an option. John, ever the optimist, piped up, Great! Then we can all find a new place together. A nice single-family home would be ideal. I stared at him, incredulous. All? I echoed. John, wouldn't a two-bedroom suffice just for you and me? He gave a humorless chuckle. Two? What about Patricia? His flippant remark was the final straw. Ignoring him, I turned to Lily. Ready, sweetie? Time to visit Grandma and Grandpa? Lily beamed. Yes, please. I miss them. John's confusion was comical. What's going on? Where are you going? I'm leaving, I stated plainly. The fear of you pushing me or Lily down the stairs one day is a nightmare I no longer want to live. John stammered. But that was just a joke, right, sis? Even Patricia, perhaps worried about losing her free maid service, chimed in with a half-hearted, Yes, let's just live together happily. The audacity of it all made me want to laugh. Happily, I scoffed. John, you can't even care for your own parents. How can you possibly take care of us? Before they could protest further, the taxi arrived. As Lily and I climbed in, I turned to John, a sliver of pity replacing the anger. Live your life however you choose, I said gently. But Lily and I are moving on. John's desperate cries of, Don't go, echoed behind us as the taxi pulled away. A wave of relief washed over me. The childishness I once found endearing in John now seemed pathetic. Leaving my in-law's house wasn't easy, but it felt like a necessary leap into an uncertain future. Yet, with Lily's hand in mine, I couldn't help but embrace the feeling of hope blossoming in my chest. As for John and Patricia, news travels fast, and their lack of savings and entitled attitude ensured their future wouldn't be easy. Maybe, just maybe, it was a lesson learned the hard way. But for them, it was already too late for regrets. The constant clatter of Patricia banging around the kitchen, ostensibly making lunch, was the final straw. Little did she know, the elaborate bento boxes she was whipping up weren't winning over her crush at work. His heart belonged to another, and her dramatic shift from gourmet lunches to sad, soggy sandwiches became office gossip fodder. My friend, who worked alongside Patricia, relayed the story with a smirk. I couldn't help but chuckle. Patricia, the master manipulator, oblivious to the amusement she caused. But for me, the amusement had worn thin. Living with my in-laws, constantly battling Patricia's entitlement and John's general apathy, had taken its toll. The decision to leave had been brewing, fueled by John's lack of engagement with Lily. He spent more time slaying dragons on his video games than playing peekaboo with his daughter. Lily, however, seemed to be adjusting well. Back in my childhood home, surrounded by the warmth of my parents, her laughter echoed through the house. Preschool had brought new playmates and a smile that was permanently etched on her face. There were tears, of course, but not for John. My focus was on building a life without regrets. A life where mornings began with pancakes and bedtime stories, not arguments over chores and living expenses. A life where Lily felt cherished and secure. When she was older, if she wished to see her father, I wouldn't stand in her way. It was her right. But for now, our little family unit, nestled in the familiar comfort of my parents' home, was all I needed. John and Patricia, on the other hand, 
were facing the consequences of their actions. Their lack of savings and childish behavior meant their future wouldn't be a walk in the park. Maybe, just maybe, it would be a lesson learned, albeit a harsh one.